Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. We're continuing our discussion and analysis of U.S.-Saudi relations. In this segment, we're going to specifically talk about the Saudi royal family, the decentralization of power, and all the various princes in Saudi Arabia that are contending with each other. Now joining us once again is Madawi al-Rashid. She's a visiting professor at the Middle East Center at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Her recent publications include A History of Saudi Arabia and A Most Masculine State. Thanks again for joining us, Madawi. Thank you. So there seems to be kind of two different takes on the Saudi uh, uh, royal family elite. One, one is this is kind of an absolute monarchy with a king that kind of controls everything. Uh, the other, uh, I think, is the, the one, uh, as I read your material, this is more like uh, medieval fiefdom with lots of different princes and fiefdoms carving up various centers of power within the, within the government, and the king acts more like a chairman of the board, I guess you could say. Uh, could you t explain that, and, and, and then we'll get into it a little more? Yes, I think um, since the uh, succession to the throne is uh, very uh, unusual, in Saudi Arabia. It moves from brother to brother. And this system hasn't existed uh, simply because of its durability that is in question. But the Saudi royal family uh, was um, um, into this kind of system that was put in place in the 1930s by the founder of Saudi Arabia. So when he died, uh, before he died, he designated his son to be the crown prince, and also said that uh, in future succession it should be it should go from one brother to another. And he had more than 35 sons, but he didn't anticipate uh, the 21st century when all of those sons are going to be old at the same time. Um, um, and sometime um, um, uh, there are quite a number of them who are not fit to rule. So the succession principle in Saudi Arabia claims that it follows the uh, principle of seniority. But in fact, it, it can skip a person, a brother who is not fit to rule and goes to another one. And this is a political game. There are uh, obviously uh, no uh, serious equality among the surviving brothers of the king. So there are uh, some who are more uh, powerful and more privileged than others. So King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia faces this challenge. The brothers are becoming a smaller group and most of them are old. He is in his 90s and the crown prince is in his late uh, 70s, almost 80 year old. And he wanted to um, ensure that there is a smooth succession. So he created what is called the Oath of Allegiance Committee. And he stipulated in his constitution that only after he dies, this committee can meet and elect in inverted commas, the king. And the committee members are 33 or 34 uh, princes. And therefore, it's a secret affair, secret committee that will meet. But obviously, he didn't wait uh, until he dies and wanted to assure the international community that he is in control and uh, the future of Saudi Arabia is going to be in good hands. So he chose um, a, a deputy crown prince, uh, Prince Mugren, in order to uh, um, uh, ensure that this is a relatively young, younger prince, young, relatively meaning that he's in his 70s, that will become king in case the king himself and the crown prince die uh, uh, at the same time or one after the other. And in this way, he kept faithful to the principle of horizontal succession, meaning the type of succession that goes from brother to brother and avoided the tricky issue of moving to a vertical succession from father to son, simply because the various younger sons of the uh, um, uh, founder of Saudi Arabia have all managed to establish themselves in ministries. Some of them have serious military power, such as, for example, the king's own son, Mitaib bin Abdullah, who controls the National Guard. And the National Guard is a paramilitary organization that has a huge budget, that is armed, that has helicopters, airplanes, etc. And also it has a tribal base. Another son of, uh, of, of the king's brother, and that is Muhammad bin Nayef, he is in control of the Ministry of Interior, Interior, which is the largest and most powerful ministry that deals with internal affairs. 
other sons command the army or the navy. Uh, and therefore, we, came, we come to this situation where the second generation is varied and with some second generation princes more powerful than the others. And the king obviously could not resolve the succession by uh, moving it to this to a member of the second generation. So he chose Prince Mugren as a, a safe bet uh, to avoid uh, the uh, shift from the brothers to their son uh, being open and, uh, and also subject to perhaps conflicting demands. Uh, the problem is uh, there's so many sons who are waiting their turn and therefore the king couldn't really reach a consensus when he did his discussion with the other 33 members. And they dis decided that uh, Mugrin is perhaps going to be the future king. And in my view, he's going to be an honorary king that is going to uh, 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 rule over these multiple fiefdoms with each second generation prince in control of a substantial ministry or even a region uh, in Saudi Arabia. So in in terms of the uh, princes who are governors of important regions such as the Eastern Province where most of the oil is or in the um, uh, other part of Saudi Arabia in the West where the religious uh, cities are or even in Riyadh where the largest uh, concentration of the population is. And therefore Saudi Arabia has moved beyond the single kingdom to multiple kingdoms with each prince uh, assuming greater power with enormous resources and Saudis will have to attach them the, themselves to one prince or another and be part of his circle as a, 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 in a patron-client relationship because this is the only way of getting things done in Saudi Arabia despite the fact that there are so many uh, um, um, modern looking institutions that have been created to deal with government and bureaucracy. But Politics remains personalized and it revolves around the princes and their clients. Now, in, in medieval times, and this is pretty medieval in structure, even though they have lots of oil and modern weapons and technology, but in medieval times, this kind of uh, structure often led to various kinds of struggles between the various kingdoms. Uh, how likely is that to break up? At the moment, we don't see any signs, uh, but I think choosing Prince Mugren to be the future king uh, is a reflection of the danger that uh, may happen uh, once this conflict between the various fiefdoms erupt. So it is basically a, a question. Who is going to be courageous enough to say that succession goes through his line of descent rather than his brother's line of descent? And we wait to see how this is going to be resolved. If it's not resolved, I think what will happen is that we have this honorary king, a symbolic figure while uh, leaving each prince to enjoy his own fiefdom and uh, the resources that come with controlling substantial ministries. Who, can, who controls foreign policy and, and, and this, ec this assertion of regional power? You, I mean, you can't have like 10, 15 princes all trying to run this, or, or do they? Does, well, is there 10, 15 exactly, different agendas here? This is exactly what we have in Saudi Arabia. So, for example, the official uh, minister of uh, for, uh, foreign affairs is Prince Saud al-Faisal, but we find that his brother, Turki al-Faisal, also gives interviews and always insists that he's talking in his personal capacity because he does not have an official uh, uh, post in the Saudi government. Uh, but again, uh, the, the foreign policy is not run by just Saud al-Faisal. We find that each uh, uh, file is given to a prince. So the, the king was giving the Syrian file to Bandar bin Sultan, but then so recently we know that he replaced him uh, uh, after Mohammed bin Nayef, the minister of interior, visited Washington. So we have the minister of interior dealing with the Syrian file, which should be a foreign policy uh, a position. And therefore there is this mix up. 
uh, of politics as as it is very personalized and the ministries uh, are sometimes competing with each other because each prince is, ma- is trying hard to maximize his sphere of influence so even if you are a minister of interior you are given a, a foreign uh, a policy uh, file to deal with and the same thing happens with Yemen so uh, the king uh, dispatches his son but again sometimes it's the intelligence services and and there is that kind of uh, mess that is uh, kept in in check by the uh, the fact that the stakes are so high if this conflict erupts. And what happened to Bandar? Bandar was the uh, Saudi ambassador to the United States throughout the Bush most of the Bush administration. His nickname was Bandar Bush. He was so cozy with the Bush family. Uh, Bandar, he kind of dropped out of sight for a while, then he came back as head of the, I, I believe, head of the National Security Council in Saudi Arabia, more or less running intelligence. I mean, Bandar is, is certainly one of the people thought, if in fact the, the Senate Congressional Committee that investigated 9-11 is, is correct, and there was Saudi government involvement in the 9-11 attacks, well, then a lot of speculation goes that Bandar had to have known or been involved in it. Certainly, Bandar is the guy that threatens Tony Blair, as I told the story in an earlier segment. It's Bandar that threatens Putin. It's Bandar that very recently says that the United Saudi Arabia is going its own way in foreign policy because the United States has betrayed them and is too weak on Syria and such and such. And now, all of a sudden, Bandar gets removed from his position. Uh, he's a very, he's an, is he not still an important player in all this? Well, it is very difficult to know because Bender hasn't always been uh, uh, the the front the, the the person who is supposed to deal with foreign policy. And this just proves what I said earlier, that you don't know who's dealing with which file, and there is no transparency in all this. And it is basically a personalized form of government. Uh, Anybody with uh, good contacts can be dispatched to Yemen or to Syria or anywhere else in order to sort out some mess that was created or even create more mess. And sometimes the policies do not actually uh, uh, make sense. Uh, And the same thing happened in 2003. So we have one prince opposed to the American invasion of Iraq, another prince welcoming the invasion. And therefore, there are multiple branches who can't agree on a foreign policy and even on reform on the domestic front. So to just another example of this mess that is created in Saudi Arabia because of the multiplicity of princes uh, on political reform. Uh, In 2004, 2005, King Abdullah presented himself as the, the the reformist king who is going to empower women, who is going to listen to reformers, who is going to encourage activists and receive their petitions and deal with their petitions. But he was completely um, uh, helpless when his brother at the time, Prince Nayef, who was running the Ministry of Interior, put most of the reformers in prison uh, for a couple of years. And then in 2005, uh, King Abdullah pardoned them. But the same uh, reformers were imprisoned again in 2008. And King Abdullah was helpless. He couldn't actually oppose his brother, King uh, Prince Nayef, uh, who put them in prison. So we don't actually know how uh, government works in Saudi Arabia simply because of these multiple princes. Each one of them has his own uh, uh, constituency and his own ideas about how the government should be run. Uh, and therefore, uh, we come to some kind of stagnation. Now, just finally, there's been a lot of talk in the press about how increased oil and gas production in the United States is, is changing the U.S.-Saudi relationship. And, and, and in general, Saudis uh, getting increasingly concerned about just how much global leverage th- they will have in, in five or 10 or 15 years. How much is that affecting the Saudi politics? It must worry Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia has promoted itself uh, with the help of uh, think tanks in Washington that it is a swing producer of oil, that it uh, helps Western economies, um, and it is actually capable of increasing its production uh, in a very short period of time and deal with any kind of shortages. So this is the narrative. This is the myth about Saudi Arabia. But now Saudi Arabia feels threatened first by... uh, Iran as well. Uh, If Iranian oil becomes available uh, in in markets, this is bound to impact uh, Saudi Arabia 
Also, Iraqi oil uh, is extremely important. And if there is some stability in Iraq and it can actually uh, uh, go to its full potential, then the availability of new oil from Iran and Iraq will actually diminish Saudi Arabia's important, uh, importance. Added to this, the, the talk, the energy research that is being done about the U.S. becoming uh, self-sufficient, etc. And I think uh, uh, Saudi oil will remain important, um, if, at least for China, for Asia, and for Europe. Uh, even before this uh, 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 talk about American oil, uh, we know that America didn't actually uh, uh, import quite a lot of oil from Saudi Arabia, and most of Saudi oil goes to other places, such as in Europe and uh, Asia. Mm -hmm. Asia. Well, perhaps, perhaps this objective of, of keeping Iraqi and Iranian oil off market, or at least limited on the market, maybe that also explains some of why there's such a, a mortal threat, quote unquote, from the Shia. I mean, if you can keep civil war going in Iraq and you can keep Iran under sanctions, uh, you, it certainly helps you if you're Saudi Arabia. Yes, absolutely, it helps. But you know, the, the argument is not put in economic terms, and they do not. The Saudis do not want to admit that it's all about money. It's all about oil and resources, and therefore there is this rhetoric about sectarian religious wars uh, uh, that are sponsored by this group or that group. But there is a, 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 a quite a, an important factor uh, in the form of oil and more oil coming uh, to markets. And this would actually dilute Saudi Arabia's importance. And therefore, if you could keep that uh, oil away and uh, or keep its uh, countries unstable, and therefore uh, it is beneficial from a purely economic uh, uh, sort of formula. It's beneficial to Saudi Arabia. All right. Thanks very much for joining us, Madeli. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.